Welcome to the New Hampshire Union Leaders Voters First Forums. My name is Joe McQuaid, publisher of the Union Leader. And I'm Todd Fahey, State Director of AARP New Hampshire. AARP is a nonpartisan advocacy organization. We're looking forward to hearing candidate positions on important issues. This year, we're focused on Social Security and what candidates will do to ensure that this program remains strong and available for future generations. If you're watching this live on YouTube, feel free to submit a question. And now, let's hear from a candidate. Right. We're on the air or on YouTube or something uh, with Senator Kelly Ayotte, who's kindly decided to come in and speak with Dan Toohey, our reporter, and Trent Spinner, our editor, and myself uh, about the campaign, which you are in the midst of, and all the issues. And we, ha we happen to be uh, co-sponsored by AARP of New Hampshire. Great. Uh, and one of the reasons that they did that, besides they like us, um, is that Social Security is of great concern to them, and they don't think that it's being brought up much as an issue and where the candidates stand on it. So where is Kelly Ayotte on Social Security? Do you have a plan to fix it, or is it not broke, as Trump says? Um, well, first of all, I, I had the privilege of actually meeting with AARP last week because they, they gave me an award for some of the work I've been doing um, addressing uh, the aging population and caregiving and a whole host of issues. So I think that we, as you look at Social Security, um, my, my grandparents who lived into their 90s and my meme wouldn't have made it without Social Security. So it's a very important program, but the reality is by 2034, according to uh, the trustees, that just they're not Republicans or Democrats, they just look at the numbers. Um, it unfortunately goes insolvent. And if we did nothing between now and then, then people would see a 25% cut in Social Security, and that wouldn't be right. So I firmly believe, I'm in the camp of we need to work together to make sure that this program is sustainable. And for those who are um, seniors now who are relying on it, and those are near retirement, we, we can't make changes there because they, they can't adjust. But for to make sure this program is viable going forward, I think it's time for us to get together like Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill did. Um, they were able to work across the aisle and they came to a compromise where this may not be the idea, but it's one of the ways you can work together. Uh, they re raised the cap um, and then they also gradually um, aligned and changed uh, the, the retirement piece in terms of when people retired and they did it very, very gradually. It's still actually going into place right now with some of the changes they made. And because of that, they actually sustained and really made Social Security stronger and viable for 30 years, 40 years. And so that, to me, is the kind of work that we need to do together. Um, one thing that I look as I look at Social Security, just some of the numbers that make a difference. If you go back to 1950, we had 16 and a half people working for every one recipient of Social Security. Today, um, we have roughly 2.8 three people working for everyone. And so as, as we look at the big picture, not only reforming and, and finding ways to preserve and sustain Social Security, uh, we better also improve our labor participation rate. And uh, right now we have one of the lowest labor participation rates um, in, since basically Jimmy Carter. And so getting people working and actually looking at the economic piece is another piece to not only parties getting together to sustain and reform and make sure Social Security is viable and strong going forward um, and fiscally sustainable. But also, we better look at the work piece, too, because uh, if, if you continue to have you know, people dropping out of the workforce, you can see how that doesn't sustain a, a viable system going forward. So I would also focus on a lot of things that would improve our economy. Um, number one, tax reform. Uh, number, regulatory reform. Uh, also, you know, when we had things in the health care law that really discouraged people um, from many have dropped out of the workforce, whether changing the 40-hour work week, some of those examples, we have to have policies that encourage work as well. So I think that's part of the Social Security discussion also. Well, 
You didn't say anything specific there about how you would change Social Security. There have been yeah, several at, plans I, that are out there, including a House Republican one. Uh, what's what's right or wrong with that? Uh, you know, I think we're not going to, we've got to come together. It's got to be bipartisan. And so there are a number of ways you could look at it. Um, and I'm open to looking at all of them. So you've got the cap issue, increasing the cap. So that's one piece. Um, you've got the, you know, the make, issue being how much money so how much is, how much is actually taxed in terms of social security and you could increase that. And that's what Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill did. Um, you can also, people are living longer and working, uh, obviously living longer and longer lives, which is terrific. Uh, but making sure, uh, that this, the retirement age is lined up for younger people. Um, not for those who are in Social Security now, um, like Ronald Reagan, they, they gradually extended the retirement age. So uh, what should it be for Senator Ayotte? Well, I think, uh, you know, certainly for, for me right now, uh, right now it will be, because I was born in 68, it will be 67. And so if, if I have to uh, work a little bit longer to sustain it for other people um, and, and others, I think it's important. And I also think that we can also look at people like me um, means testing and things like that, uh, where perhaps um, I take less uh, so that other people who really need it, uh, that they can receive that and make sure that they get it. Um, so I think those are, the, those are three main ways that we can come together and preserve it. But if we don't deal with the work piece also, um, you're going to continue to have um, a, a system where if people aren't participating in the workforce, it needs to be a robust system going forward. Your uh, presidential candidate, Mr. Trump, says uh, Social Security does not need to be touched uh, at all. So I guess that's an area where you disagree with him. Can well, you, I, would, I agree. Let me just say I agree when it comes to those who are receiving it now or near, because I don't think they can plan if we make changes. And so we need to make sure that people have retirement security. So on that end, but if, if, to say that you aren't going to do anything means that you want it to go insolvent. In, in, in other words, you want it to be in a position where by 2034, you'd see a 25% cut in benefits and no plan to sustain it going forward. And I don't stand in that camp. And in fact, um, one of the things that I don't like in politics is when things like Social Security and Medicare are used as uh, you know, political footballs or political attacks. When, as you look at the fiscal state of the country, if we don't address uh, the viability and sustainability of these programs, um, then the people who need them the most, then they're not going to be sustainable. And so to me, I want to solve problems and I want to make sure that this is viable going forward. Are there uh, two things in Trump's record that you can cite that you approve of, that you admire? Yes, I would say, um, number one, I fully agree with him on the Iran deal. I think that was a very poor deal for the country and continues to show that it is uh, with Iran's bad behavior. Um, I also well, maybe, maybe I'm misstating the question. I didn't mean positions that he's taken today, of which he's taken pretty much everything on every side of every issue. I meant in his career, are there two things that he's accomplished that you admire? Name two. Uh, I would say, obviously, he's been a successful businessman. Not every business he's you know, worked on has succeeded, but he's had some, some very good successes. So I certainly admire the capability of uh, being able to, to work in the private sector and to, to build and grow successful business. You know, my husband has a small business, so I know that's, that's not easy. Um, second, I admire him as a father. I think that uh, clearly, he, having seen his kids and how they conduct themselves, that uh, he's done something well there uh, as a parent because his, clearly his kids conduct themselves very well. Okay. Let's talk about the race. You have Jim Rubens who is trying to make the argument that he's more conservative. Um, and then you have all kinds of groups hitting you from the left, outside groups. How do you sort of navigate that over the next uh, 80, or I guess less than 80 days now? Uh, I think for me, I'm just going to continue uh, to number one, be myself. Uh, worked. I, I firmly believe in working across the aisle, um, a common sense conservative. So being able to, uh, when things are going in the direction that I don't agree with under this administration, to stand up and oppose uh, policies that I don't think are right for the country. 
uh, but also I do have a very strong bipartisan record, so working across the aisle to get things done because uh, people in New Hampshire deserve someone who's going to uh, work across the aisle, whether it's on the heroin epidemic, you know, whether it's on issues that, that relate to health care affordability, whether it's issues of getting our fiscal house in order, um, all of those issues to me, um, you have to have an ability, yes, to be firm on your principles, but to be able to work across the aisle. And that's the approach I've taken, and that's what I'm going to continue to take on this campaign. How do you think all of this outside money, and there are some estimates that put it between 80 and 100 million dollars, how do you think all of this outside money coming in from groups out of state on both sides, how do you think that impacts the race? Um, I think that, first of all, this race needs to be and is about New Hampshire. And uh, New Hampshire voters are the ones that matter. So it is disappointing to see, you know, all the, the pile on of all this uh, third party spending that comes in. I mean, just to put it in perspective, since the beginning of June, there's been $11 million spent against me on, on negative ads primarily uh, that are, you know, saying a lot of things that aren't true. So, you know, I, I have a lot of confidence, though, in the people of New Hampshire. Uh, you know, I'm out meeting people, grassroots. I mean, at the old home days, I was at the Chili Festival yesterday in Henniker, um, you know, the model train show in Concord, and, uh, you know, yes, Nashua Beer beer festival on Saturday, you got to get out there and meet the voters. So as much as I, I think, you know, the, all these ads that are out there trying to pile on, they don't come from New Hampshire. And the people who are going to decide this race are in New Hampshire, because this is about who's going to be New Hampshire's voice in the Senate, uh, not Harry Reid's voice or Chuck Schumer's or some other group's voice. So, um, so that's where my focus is. And that's why I'm out also doing a lot of grassroots campaigning. Senator, you talked earlier about working across the aisle. Um, you were supportive of uh, Obama's clean power plan, and you've gotten some heat from that within your own party. Can you describe why you support it and why you think it's not a costly mandate for businesses? Uh, yes. First of all, I, I believe strongly in protecting New Hampshire's environment. And I do think, though, that often the discussion in Washington becomes too exclusive, protect the environment or, or the economy, and it has to be a discussion about both. And I think that's certainly been the New Hampshire approach. We have a long, strong bipartisan record of protecting New Hampshire's environment because it's so important to our economy and who we are. So uh, if you go back to my time as attorney general, um, I work very strongly in that job to protect New Hampshire's environment. And as I looked at the clean power plan, uh, first of all, New Hampshire, I did a lot of work talking to businesses about it not, and talking about to, to environmental groups and a whole host of stake, stakeholders about this. And that right now, New Hampshire's in the p position to meet the requirements of the Clean Power Plan because of what we've already put in place here. And I believe it's important to protect our environment going forward. Um, and that's why I've crossed the aisle on, you know, mercury emissions. I've crossed the aisle on um, the emissions coming from the Midwest power plants. And this is actually all consistent with a lot of work that I did while I was attorney general. Because if we, I believe New Hampshire will, uh, because we're already meeting these standards, we'll, we'll make sure that we're in a strong position for our economy with this going forward as well. We have a YouTube question, and I'm not going to read it word for word because I don't think it accurately captures some of the work that you did in the Senate. So um, I'm going to. There's the damn meteor again. Well, I'm just going <laughs> to. I'm just going to. can't trust them. <laughs> I'm going to change it around. So the, the question starts with New Hampshire students facing the highest average student loan debt in the country. Can you explain sort of what your philosophy on what should happen with students who need to refinance their student loans? Yes. Um, in fact, I worked a few years ago. The rates were going to double uh, for students. And I actually worked uh, with a group that came together across the aisle to make sure that the loans we could address um, the, the rates not doubling because essentially they were not tied at that point with what was happening with the Federal Reserve. And so there was, we, we stopped the rates from doubling at that point and worked together and that took bipartisan work. So I was glad to support that. I also think um, with what's happened under the president and the health care law, uh, the student loan market has essentially become the federal government. And the, you know, the, the, the health care law included the takeover of most of the student loan market. And so it's really, um, number one, 
in, it's reduced a number of opportunities even in the private sector for refinancing. So um, I, I've introduced a bill that would allow for um, students that are eligible and want to, they don't have to, an option within the private uh, sector to be able to refinance because that frankly they can get a lot better rates right now than they can with what they might have been stuck in in a government loan. And this idea actually came, um, it was a great idea, it came locally from me and it came locally from some of our small banks that would like to be able to help people um, refinance their loans appropriately who are good credit risks and should be able to do that. So I have a piece of legislation to do that. I have also think that we need to have schools have more skin in this game. And you know, there's a lot of money, federal money, um, that is obviously with the federal uh, student loans and what's, what's happening in terms of providing support for students, which is important so that people can have access uh, to higher education. But there needs to be some accountability on the, uh, on the school end, too, uh, to say, you know, where, where is this price structure? Are you going to be focusing also on how much an education costs? Because at some point, this is getting, you know, to a point where the prices keep going up at a rate that doesn't reflect the consumer protect, you know, the consumer price index or other measures. So uh, I, I think that, you know, having, you know, we're not going to, obviously tell the schools what to charge, but you know, with these student loans, there needs to be some accountability that's not there. And there have been some ideas in legislation, um, one bill introduced by Orrin Hatch, and that, that I think is a good idea in terms of putting some more transparency and skin in the game there for, for the colleges. Exactly what? Um, I've heard many politicians say that the student loans, we have to make sure that the students have uh, the availability to pay back their loans. We do. But I've heard nothing specific about capping the cost that colleges charge these people. That rate that you talked about, it's like double inflation for the past 20 years. So what is in Orrin Hatch's bill that would uh, hold them accountable? Well, it's, it's actually going to have, you know, if you want to be eligible for student loans, it has certain measures of, you know, how rates are going up and, and having them have to report this information. And so it's a step forward. It doesn't give them price fix or anything, but it's more transparency and actually requiring colleges to, to actually say, you know, wh wh what is going to be your cost structure going forward if you're going to receive the student loans. So it's, it's a small step forward, I think. But if we don't deal with the cost issue, I don't think we're going to be in a position where um, you know, we can provide opportunities for financing, and I'm all for that. Uh, but the cost structure and engaging the universities who receive a lot of public money, whether in research and other areas, of what are you going to do about cost if you're going to continue to receive federal aid, I think is a fair conversation. If you don't want to take the federal aid, fine. But if you do, then why aren't you also saying we're going to keep our cost structure limited too? That's great. But other than the small step that Orrin Hatch is, has in his bill, Senator Ayotte has no plans to address this specifically? Uh, I would like to see um, us move in this direction. And one of the challenges is, is putting together legislation that doesn't, I don't believe in cost fixing, obviously, but I think holding uh, colleges in a position where they um, actually have to have some skin in this game before they receive the federal aid. And so um, I think this is something we should work together across the aisle on. Do I have all the answers? No. Um, and, but I think if we don't address this issue, and I'd like to talk to the colleges about how we do it, and they may not like all of it, but I think we've got to do it. Um, otherwise, we're going to be in a position of, uh, of again, I want to provide access. I fought to extend Perkins loans. I fought to preserve Pell Grants. I fought to provide more uh, refinancing opportunities, but I think this is a missing piece of it. I think, uh, and I also think we should you know, try to get the best minds together and solve this. Okay. I've, I've screwed you out of the college president's vote now with that answer because you're going to hold them accountable. This weekend, I told two Republicans of long standing in the state of New Hampshire, neither of them a politician, that you were going to be in here today. Yes. They had two things to say. The first one said, he's not voting for you because you did not have the decency to show up in Cleveland even for a day, and this, you busy campaigning, does not wash with this guy. I was, I was astounded. The other one said he's probably not going to vote for you because you have not shown the political courage to dump Trump and stand as an independent voice for New Hampshire. So 
How do you respond to those two? Um, I would say, number one, um, I have been an independent voice for New Hampshire. And if you look at, for example, the government shutdown, it was me who actually was part of a group, and I helped lead an effort in my own caucus to take on Ted Cruz when I thought that there was, number one, no strategy, no end game, and it wasn't the right direction um, to achieve a result or the right way to do it, even though I didn't agree with the health care law either. So I think that uh, that I have a demonstrated record to do that, whether it's Ted Cruz or it's whether my ability to work across the aisle on getting things done, um, on the heroin legislation, on issues obviously that pertain to our national security, a whole host of issues. So I would say I would say to, to both of them, uh, you know, the notion of that uh, you would look, at, not look at my whole uh, work that I've done, which has been very strong as an independent voice for New Hampshire. I hope that uh, they would look at this. And I would also say, look at Maggie Hassan in this race, because uh, I haven't heard yet one time where she's had a major disagreement with uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton. Uh, and I don't see her being an independent voice for New Hampshire or standing up to her own party in the way that I have done on many occasions on behalf of this state. Well, Governor Hassan did say that she thought uh, Secretary Clinton was honest and trustworthy. That's a good example, <laughs> is, exactly. Is, um, are there any plans in the AOT campaign to use that particular CNN interview <laughs> with Governor Hassan? I, uh, Governor Pence uh, played it at his rally last week in Manchester, the CNN yes, clip that. of Governor I Hassan. Um, I think it just speaks for itself, number one. Um, you know, if you look at this campaign, the, you know, where... Where is she, where is she going to stand up to her own party when it's necessary for New Hampshire? I will. I've done it. I'll, you know, I'll do it where, I, where it's uh, wrong for New Hampshire, I'm going to stand up, no matter who it is. Other side, there's, you know, my own party, whatever. And I don't see that. I haven't seen an example of that. And I think the reason she obviously didn't answer the question about uh, Hillary Clinton's honesty, the, the clear answer is that with what happened with that email, clearly the answer is, no. Uh, so, you know, I call it like I see it. You may not always agree with me, but I will call it like I see it. We did have a YouTube question since you brought it up, uh, and you can answer this in one word if you'd like. Do you think Hillary Clinton is honest and trustworthy? No. Is Donald Trump honest and trustworthy? Uh, I think that he, you know, he, he certainly hasn't had the, the big public issue is Hillary Clinton. Has he always been? No. I don't think so. In what regards? I think in some ways he has been in terms of what he thinks. Um, but, you know, I can't speak to his whole history. So I don't, you know, I don't know every single thing that he's done. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that he clearly says what he thinks. So I, what do you think changes from day to day? Is there anything that this... Well, guy, I mean, what Hillary Clinton thinks changes from day to day but, as well. But, but, yeah, but she doesn't say what it is because she hasn't had a press conference in more than 250 or 257 days, so that's not a, not a problem for her. The, the Trump is the big elephant in the room, though, uh, for you. There's... You, you have sliced and diced it, you're supporting him, but not endorsing him. Well, I'm voting for him, yeah. So you're not supporting him, you're just voting for him. Yeah, I, I think when I said I was supporting him, it meant I was voting for him, and people have asked me a lot, what is, what's the difference between you know, that and endorsing? There's a big difference, actually, because I endorsed, for example, Mitt Romney, and I campaigned a lot for him, both in New Hampshire. I spent a couple weeks on a bus with him, and uh, not only did I campaign in New Hampshire, but I was willing to go to other states for him as well, to campaign for him. And, uh, you know, this race, uh, I'll be voting for our nominee, uh, but I'm not endorsing. I have some disagreements with him, which I've been very clear on. Uh, but well, I don't think our country... You, Senator. He came out last I'm glad to get his endorsement. Thank him, but, you know, that's yeah. fine. But, you know, I think that the issue is that um, I disagree with him uh, on a number of fronts. So... I think the issue is that uh, that's 
people get one vote, and I can't vote to send, you know, if voting for Secretary Clinton is sending our country in continuing uh, where we're going, which I'm concerned about, which is essentially a third, at, le at least a third term of this presidency on the debt, on the fiscal state of the country, on foreign policy, uh, which she obviously was heavily involved in as Secretary of State under President Obama. Under foreign policy, uh, the Pentagon said today that last Thursday we had to send U.S.-led coalition jets to take on Syrian aircraft over a city in northern Syria where we have ground forces helping the Syrian rebels. What would you do about the Syrian conflict in the Senate in terms of legislation or in speaking out as to what we should do with the situation there, with, with ISIS and with the situation in Syria where the people are being bombed to hell in Aleppo and the refugees continue to pour out of the country and become a problem for the rest of the world. What's, what, what would Kelly Ayotte do? Um, well, first of all, a lot of things that, um, I can assure you one thing, Kelly Ayotte wouldn't set a red line and not follow through, where that was a big, a big mistake that, that um, it was interesting, we had General Petraeus in on Friday night, and he cited that as the implication not only for that conflict, but primarily what our allies and what our uh, friends have interpreted that to be around the world. Um, the conflict itself, priority obviously ISIS, and I think there are a number of things that we should be stronger on. I'm glad that we've just apparently succeeded along the Syrian border in what's called the Manbij pocket because that was a porous area where um, these foreign fighters were coming over from Turkey. And so that was an important operation. But I've said um, that we need to have uh, the airstrikes were, uh, they're stronger now, uh, but they are not um, our, our folks that were operating under rules of engagement where I would get reports from the field of people who, having served on the Armed Services Committee, would tell me um, you know, that we see military targets and we're waiting and we're waiting to get permission to drop. So number one, you've got to give those who are dropping uh, on the targets there the rules of engagement that they need to be able to take out the military targets. We waited a year to take out the fuel trucks, even though we knew we are. That's a good example of that. Um, second, I think that we need to continue to more directly support the Kurds who are um, you know, reliable, strong fighting force in the area, and they've had a lot of difficulties where they've come to also the Armed Services Committee where they've said that the military assets they need aren't always getting directly to them. And I would give them directly to them rather than going through the Iraqi central government. Um, I would also engage uh, NATO on this problem much more aggressively. The president has not called together NATO about, um, NATO had a meeting uh, now probably six weeks ago where they are gonna provide train and assist support for the Iraqi forces to take on um, to take on ISIS. But we could, uh, as one of the leaders and obviously probably the strongest leader of NATO, really have called NATO together and said, I need, we need more to do here. Because we all, you all have, you've been attacked, um, you know, Paris, Brussels, uh, Istanbul, bring everyone together to say, what are you going to put in also more to strongly on uh, the NATO countries on, on more air support, on more ground support, uh, to take out ISIS in both Iraq and Syria. Um, I would also say that doing that, we would have more confidence in our Arab partners to, uh, to get them to engage on this uh, more strongly. If we had, I think, a stronger posture with our leadership role, in both NATO and with our, uh, the Arab countries which need to help us fight this. In terms of the refugees, I've supported a safe zone. I've supported establishing it. I think we should have done it long ago. It's much more difficult to do right now because of uh, the, you know, the conditions on the grounds have got, ground have gotten worse. So obviously some of those decisions made sooner um, would have been better decisions. But if you look at the flow of these uh, refugees, they have inundated Europe. ISIS has also weaponized the refugees. So um, they have infiltrated the refugees and put in players in the refugees. 
uh, to go in through, and we've seen some examples of that with, um, with some of the individuals involved in the attacks in Europe. So uh, in doing that, you'd have to have a no-fly zone. You'd have to have uh, conditions on the ground to keep them there. But otherwise, this flow is going to continue if you don't have um, that safe zone. Doing this sooner would have made a much bigger difference and been easier to do than where we are now. I would also say Russia is a big issue in all of this. So you now have Russia actually launching, um, using Iranian airspace to launch um, you know, launch into uh, Syria. And here's the problem. Russia has actually in, been, in some instances, taking out the forces that we are hoping to help us on the ground to defeat ISIS because of Assad's interest. Russia is more interested, in my humble opinion, of propping up Assad than really doing what they need to do to address uh, the overall problem on the ground that is uh, killing people, causing more refugees, and the ISIS problem. So we need to be, I've thought from the beginning that we needed to be tougher on Russia. Um, this president has not, and there's been a lot of things that have happened that have demonstrated to Putin that he's not willing to stand up to Putin, including not even providing defensive arms to those people in Ukraine, um, including uh, when there's been, for example, Russia has violated the INF Treaty, not strongly holding them accountable for those things. And so um, I think that you have to engage Russia in a tougher posture to get them to stop some of their behavior that is enabling and, and um, undermining some of our interests on the ground. If we want to put that safe zone in place and if we want to be in a position where the forces we can um, you know, where, where our, some of our special forces are trying to help with some of the, uh, in the, the forces on the ground that want to defeat ISIS, that are native forces, then if we don't uh, do that and, and engage them in this, we're going to have a hard time doing the things I just talked to you about. Two things you just said regarding that are things that your presidential candidate seems to be on the other side of. Uh, one is Russia is, is our ally. Not, not our enemy in this, according to the guy that you want to be commander in chief. And uh, secondly, um, he has a pay to play uh, plan for NATO. Um, if you don't pay your dues and you get invaded, don't expect anything from the United States. Um, how, how do you counter that message or do you agree with it? Uh, I counter it, just uh, counter it in the sense that I serve on the Armed Services Committee. I'll be a voice in the Senate on these issues. And he's going, you know, yes, um, he would, in terms of how things are funded and what, what gets funded, Congress has that say, and that's how our system is set up. Um, where he's right is that there's no doubt that there are a number of NATO countries, and especially Germany, who are not pulling their weight in terms of uh, spending on their defense and really putting the resources in that they should. There's no doubt that he's right about that. I've long said that, many others have. Um, so, but the notion that we wouldn't come to mutual aid, I don't agree there. Is he um, right about Russia? He's not right about Russia in the sense that um, I think that uh, Russia is a very uh, strong geopolitical foe at the moment. Um, they are clearly uh, with their behavior toward their neighbors, um, in U obviously Ukraine as a prime example, but also I cited um, some violations they've had of the INF Treaty, um, a number of incidences where in airspace that we've had some concerns. Mm -hmm. And um, right now, I think to see Russia, some of their behavior in Syria is undermining what we need to accomplish uh, to uh, help more Quicker, more quickly defeat ISIS and also make sure um, that, you know, obviously the refugees have a place, a safer place to be. And, and the more bloodshed that is there, the more people are going to be flowing and the more difficulties there are going to be uh, with these refugees. So those are three areas where I have a lot of concerns about Russia's behavior. Um, I didn't think that the president's reset policy, um, obviously I thought that was a failure. And, you know, I think he came in thinking that, that somehow, just because he was, you know, a new president, that somehow Vladimir Putin was going to act differently. But I, I, I believe Vladimir Putin only understands strength. And that actually is one thing that I actually think that uh, Mr. Trump does understand, that Vladimir Putin only understands strength. And that's, 
that is one where he has been emboldened and empowered too much under this administration. Senator, regarding the refugees, last November you said there should be a pause, uh, temporary uh, stoppage of any refugees from Syria coming into the U.S. And, and New Hampshire. Do you still feel the same way? And given that challenge, do you still support the comprehensive immigration reform bill that you voted for with Senator Shaheen in 2013? Um, well, first of all, I think they're two two very different issues. Mm -hmm. um, I do, I have supported a pause. I've said my position was that unless you could, the government could do sufficient vetting to say, we can tell you this person is not, um, you know, not engaged in ISIS or have connections to ISIS and uh, that they should not come in. And I think that's fair to the American people because uh, we should not be, we know that ISIS, there have been thousands and thousands of foreign fighters that have flowed back and forth between Iraq and Syria, many of them Europeans, and that uh, you, you cannot allow someone in this country unless you can say, as our government, we guarantee this person's not involved in ISIS. That's a fair thing to ask of our, of our government. And in the Senate, we had votes on legislation that would have dramatically strengthened the vetting done uh, for this particular set of refugees and I voted for it, and unfortunately it was blocked by the Democrats. So I think that this is still an important issue. In terms of the bill, the immigration bill, this, this issue is one I'm interested in solving because right now we have an illegal immigration system that is not good for the country and it makes us less safe and it's not where we should be. And we have a legal immigration system that needs to be reformed. And so um, I'm interested in solving this problem. The bill that I supported in terms of the illegal issue doubled the amount of border fencing, doubled the amount of agents, um, implemented an entry exit system. 40% of the people who are here illegally overstay their visa, and we do not have an entry exit system. It would have put in place a very strong E-Verify system, stronger and more comprehensive than we have now. And I think those are very important components to the illegal border security piece. And I also believe that we need to deal with the legal piece because we have uh, obviously, um, we want to have a fair system. All of us can trace our roots in some way, most of us, um, maybe not all of us, but most of us to some other country, uh, you know, Irish, Canada for me. But um, I think that if we don't have a system as I, you know, for our workforce, an immigration system focused on what our needs are uh, to grow our economy and to make our country stronger, our system right now is, you know, it doesn't focus that way and it needs to focus that way. So, um, so that's, that's why I'm interested in solving this problem. You know, this is another example where you can continue to make this a political football, but it doesn't make the country stronger. It doesn't stop illegal immigration, and it's not changing the dynamic. And let me just say one other issue that I strongly support. That's ending sanctuary cities. And in the Senate, I have voted um, to cut funding for sanctuary cities. Uh, the, and those are cities where you saw what happened to that beautiful young woman in uh, San Francisco, where the, the essentially they're putting in a policy that they're not going to cooperate with federal authorities on illegal immigrants, and I think that's wrong. Having been Attorney General of this state, I think that you should work, uh, you know, law enforcement at state, local, federal level should work cooperatively together. And this is also an area of distinction between myself and Governor Hassan because she has supported uh, efforts that would allow sanctuary cities to go forward in the past. What should be the, uh, the number of legal immigrants in the United States on, a, on an annual basis? What, what is the number of legal immigrants in the United States on an annual basis? The number of legal immigrants, I couldn't tell you. I know on the, um, on the H-1B front. Um, that's it, flu, that's the Asian flu. Yeah, that's, so it's for different categories of different workers that there's a number. I couldn't tell you the number offhand, except I will tell you that um, the numbers for, for example, the high tech workers or like the, the uh, areas where people are, you know, STEM education, some of those areas, mm -hmm. that was filled in three days. You know, those are filled very quickly because the spots are limited. And then also there's folks that come to work in our resorts uh, from other countries, uh, one of the other. So I don't know the total number, but the number should be based on what we need. 
and our workforce needs. Well, and it should be way, it should be based on um, what where where are areas where uh, we can't domestically uh, obviously um, Americans need the priority on the jobs and where those jobs can't be filled by Americans then we should be looking at how do we make sure that we have the right uh, group of people that want to come here work hard be part of our country help us grow our economy and pay their taxes learn English all those things um, that's the number it should be based and evaluated each year based on what are our needs and what are the needs of this country to make our country stronger? But it needs to be a fair system. It needs to be one where you know if you know you're treated you're treated fairly, uh, that it's done in a way uh, that yes, the people have to having been at citizenship uh, ceremonies, you know, people have to go through that process and learn about our country and be part of our country. But there's a lot of bureaucracy in that process too that I think can be looked at and it can be a better system. You referenced um, relative to Social Security the fact that there, we have the, I think, the lowest rate of employment, you said. Lowest labor participation rate. That means people who are actually participating in the workforce. So you've got a number of people who uh, are choosing not to work or not participating any longer. So how big is your workforce overall? So obviously the number of people who are paying into Social Security and the more people working, the more the program is stronger. And by the way, everything's stronger, right? So revenue you want, is stronger, uh, the country's stronger when people are participating and, and growing the country. So that's an issue. If you look at the, if you did look at the, you know, obviously the immigration bill, um, it would, if you look at and put in a, a sensible approach going forward and they're all paying into Social Security and things like that, that actually does help strength in Social Security. There was a CBO report done on that um, that showed that that's the case. But that's just about labor participation. Whether, I mean, we need people working and giving them opportunities to have good paying jobs. Should uh, law enforcement officers in uniform be endorsing candidates? If they choose to, yes. Really? Police chiefs, et cetera, should be able to go on television and say they support this candidate or that I candidate? Think it, I mean, I think it's up to each locality and each, you know, individual. So I, I can't say what, you know, each locality is going to make their own decision on an issue like that. Um, as Attorney General, you wouldn't have any problem with that? It wouldn't have been an area that I got involved in, under, especially a First Amendment area on this. Um, I didn't get involved in that as Attorney General, and I, I don't know that it's a, a role for the Attorney General um, on, on the political end, because there certainly are First Amendment issues with that. Well, there are, aren't there also concerns about a police chief or some law enforcement person who's working on the public payroll being leaned on one way or another to support somebody? Oh, I would, I would think I have great confidence in, in our law enforcement that they're not going to be leaned on by anyone. Really? I don't think so. And if that were happening, obviously we would investigate that. But yeah. Who would investigate that? Well, I think if there was a particular instance where someone was being leaned on to well, do one thing or another. We wouldn't say so. Would they? Um, I don't know. I, I've worked a lot with law enforcement in our state, and I, I think they're not shy in terms of if they felt they were being pressured inappropriately to do anything. I sure. think they'd be pretty clear about that. I don't think they'd accede to it, number one. But if they felt that they were being improperly pressured, I think they would go to the attorney general or they. Um, and that would be appropriate to investigate. Is it appropriate for law enforcement to use uh, public communications accounts to um, get involved in a political issue? You know, I... I a specific I, example. In Manchester, the police chief using the Manchester Police Department Twitter account getting involved in the gubernatorial primary by saying one of the candidates um, is nonsensical, doesn't know what he's talking about when he says there needs to be more leadership in the opiate fight. And the police chief uses the public account of the city of Manchester Police Department to opine on that. Is that appropriate? You know, Joe, I'd have to look at the circumstances Those of that are, before just, I'm going to... I just laid out the circumstances. I, I know. I think that, you know, the city's going to decide what that policy is and the state. So in terms of how 
how Twitter is used and how people express their opinions. So um, I, I don't I don't see. I don't see that as a federal issue, let me put it that way. I, I think that's going to be decided at the local level of how each, how each agency is going to appropriately allow the use of Twitter, what, what they think is allow people to express on their Twitter accounts, both the public and private Twitter accounts. Okay. We have a YouTube question. Yes. Um, and I know you've talked a lot about Iran, but what can you actually do in the Senate to hold the Obama administration accountable? Um, you know, what, what can you actually do in the Senate to, I know you're against the Iran deal, what can you do to, to, to stop it, fix it, however you want to put it? Get the ransom back. <laughs> yeah, we can't get the ransom back, unfortunately, because uh, they've already probably spent that on terrorism. But um, the, what can we do? So I think it's really, again, the power that we have, power, power of the purse, number one. And that's in appropriations bills. Um, that's in, you know, what can the administration put money like this out there? And I hope that we'll put a rider on an uh, on appropriations bill that say you can't do this. Uh, I think that's something we could do. Now, typically to get it passed, you're going to need some bipartisanship on this. So one party may not have enough votes to do it. So I'm, I'm hoping that my folks on the other side of the aisle say, why would you want to embolden players like Iran with a ransom payment because uh, since this ransom payment was given, three more Americans have been taken hostage, which is exactly why we have this policy of generally no ransom payments. Um, I think also I've introduced legislation on their ballistic missile program. So right now I have 17 co-sponsors, so I need to obviously get more sponsors to get it passed. But uh, since this deal has been inked, They've continued to test ballistic missiles, and they've done it, um, I think, without, with very little consequence, if any, from this administration. And so I've introduced separate sanctions legislation to hold them accountable on their ballistic missile program. And uh, the other piece on it, I think, is supporting allies. I mean, I think what a way we do it in the Armed Services Committee. I've been certainly a strong supporter of the military aid to Israel. Um, which is an important ally in the region that Iran threatens as well. And in fact, if you look at one of these recent ballistic missiles, it wrote on the right on the side of the <coughs> missile, like Iran wrote essentially that they wanted to wipe Israel off the off the map. So we can support also allies that counter Iran's influence as well. And then I think um, I think it's really important that we reauthorize the Iran Sanctions Act because it actually expires. Uh, before the end of this year, and it's been reintroduced on a bipartisan basis. So I'm a co-sponsor of that, and I would hope, since this has been a bipartisan effort, that we would pass the Iran Sanctions Act uh, before a new president is inaugurated, because that would make sure that the new president has the authority, if they want to imp reimpose sanctions because of bad behavior from Iran, that they have the authority under the Congress to do that. Great. Um, it's 11 o'clock. Do you know where your next meeting is? I do. Oh. Thank you. So thank you very much for coming in, and uh, we, we hope we, you are back, um, if you are back after the primary. You going to do another one? General election. Yes. Yeah, Trent is, he's a glutton for this. <laughs> Tui likes to write him up. So we appreciate it very much. Thanks. Thank you.